is a Manchester launch of Refugee Tales Volume 2. Uh, my name is Rob Page, I'm uh, one of the editors at Common Press, and we're very, very proud to be putting on this event in conjunction with the uh, Manchester Literature Festival, of course, and with support from uh, the Arts Council. Um, this project has been running for uh, four or five years now, and it could be argued that the general public's relationship with or attitude towards refugees has never been worse. Um, um, a megalomaniac gets into office at the White House um, after running a campaign that promised to build a physical wall against immigrants. Uh, the the uh, far-right alternative for Deutschland party comes third in the German, uh, German general election, uh, scored 94 seats uh, after running a very explicit anti-immigration, anti-refugee campaign. Uh, and today in Austria, the 31-year-old Sebastian Kurz is set to become the uh, youngest pr uh, premier in Europe and is most likely to form a coalition with the far-right, anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim Freedom Party. Uh, never in my lifetime, anyway, has such a vulnerable group of people, the refugee community, been so demonised and so popular a scapegoat. Uh, and never before has their point of view been so badly missing and so so uh, desperately needed in the wider conversation. Tonight's event uh, gives us a rare uh, and precious uh, access to that point of view, thanks to the extraordinary, and uh, people use the word extraordinary a lot, uh, but I really mean it in this case, the extraordinary work of two charities, uh, Kent Refugee uh, Help, and in particular, um, the, the, the fantastic uh, Gatwick Detainee Welfare Group. Um, the way tonight's event is going to work is uh, uh, Anna Pincus from uh, uh, G GDWG uh, will say a few words about her organisation and also um, how the project came to be. Um, and then we're going to hear two uh, full readings of uh, the, the stories, the tales uh, from um, Marina and Carmilla. Uh, but to begin with, uh, please put your hands together for uh, Anna Pincus. Subsequently detained, 
it's very often a trigger for symptoms of post-traumatic stress. So our visitors hear the experiences of people in the visits room, and refugee tales grew out of a response to those whispered stories. People in detention feel invisible and want their stories to be heard, but don't, don't feel safe to, to share the stories themselves. So we had to find a way to share the tales whilst respecting their anonymity. So, using the Canterbury Tales as a model of walking and sharing tales, we introduced people who had experienced detention to well-known writers who wrote the tales. Then we go on a long walk. We've had three walks so far. One from Dover to Crawley, the site of two detention centres, and one from Canterbury to Westminster, and one from Runnymede to Westminster, referencing Magna Carta. And every evening on the walk, the writers share the tales in whatever village hall or church or community centre we've arrived at. When we started out, people said, you're crazy. You're going to encounter so much hostility. Um, what contingencies have you got in place for, for when people are aggressive towards you? But we've experienced only welcome. And people seem relieved to be able to ex express hospitality in their communities. So this evening you're going to hear two tales that have been shared um, on the walks. Um, the mother's tale and the lover's tale. And when you listen to them, please remember that there are 32,000 people a year detained in 11 centres around the UK. And the stories that you're hearing are in some ways, um, they are exceptional, but in a way they're not exceptional. They were very, very, very similar stories, hundreds of them, thousands of them, stacked up behind them. So thank you, Marina and Carla. Um, to introduce our first reader tonight, Marina Warner is a novelist, a critic, a cultural historian. She is uh, currently a professor of English and creative writing at Birkbeck at the University of London and is the author of numerous uh, works of fiction, non-fiction and critical studies. Um, her, her books include uh, The Lost uh, Father, which was shortlisted for the Booker Prize, uh, Fly Away Home, which was a collection of short stories, and Once Upon a Time, which is a short history of a fairy tale. Uh, much of her writing is concerned with the analysis of mythology, folklore, and the arch architects uh, of the feminine through history and art. Uh, please put your hands together for Dr. Marina Warner. Thank you very much, um, Anna, for your introduction and for inviting me uh, with D David Hurd, the poet. I was actually reminded today by, of the Cat and Mouse Act which, if you remember, put the suffragettes in prison and then took them out again and put them in prison. And um, we were talking the other day at, at home about how the Germans didn't know that the concentration camps were in their village, or, ne or just outside their villages, and um, how this was this possible. And we thought, well, actually, it is possible. And one of the things that um, Anna's work has done is make us aware that we have these camps where these extraordinary illegal practices are taking place of imprisoning people who have done nothing, who are under no charge, for an indefinite period of time. And we're not actually gassing them, but we're breaking them. The conditions are so horrendous, the uncertainty is so dangerous, that they, and they have families, which um, you'll hear about in a moment, um, and they are um, being systematically reduced. Um, by this, this kind of regime. The excellent thing about refugee tales and the Gatwick detainees uh, welfare campaign is that it has a specific target. And this has made it actually really very, very rousing when you're on one of the walks. Because, and to see also that there's some support from MPs. Because it's a very specific demand to end indefinite detention in this country. And so, do write your MPs. It's very, a very simple, clear demand, and it is an illegal situation we are in. It's, a, it's something that, you know, I'm quite, in a sense, proud of some of the aspects of British law, and this is a true blot on the history of British law. <coughs> the Mother's Tale. 
The sacristan of the church of Our Lady of Sorrows in a suburb of northwest London was chipping at the wax deposits from the candles on the stand in the side chapel, where the special miraculous statue looks down from a starry conch, glinting in blue and gold mosaics. The Saxon was a small, wiry woman in her 70s, I reckon, and I went over to her to talk. Since the recent ferocious sentences on the Gatwick 15, who tied themselves to the undercarriage of a plane in protest, and the murders of the MP Joe Cox, and the Pearl Arcadius at Joswick in Harlow, and the battering of the teenager and Reko Ahmed in Hounslow, my editor's been telling me to follow up on refugee stories. I'd heard about the case of Cecilia on Yipkupo and her family at high risk of deportation. They were regular attenders of services and dues at the church, so I was hoping to be given away and meeting them. The Sanderson told me her name, Dukna, when I showed her my business card. She knew the paper I worked for, I worked for, the local free rank, door to door, and she was happy to talk. I first saw Cecilia after Mass, oh, it must be several years ago, and I noticed her because, well, she isn't somebody you'd miss, is she? Even now, after everything that's happened to her, She's still one of those people who could say God lavished with gifts. You know, when he made us in the Garden of Eden, Father Damien says, and he has a way with words, that we were truly beautiful then. Like leopards and gazelles, roses and oranges, pools and streams, and the angels were overcome by the beauty of it all. When they first saw creation, they spread their rainbow wings wide and waved them up and down to show God they appreciated his work. That's what Father Damien says. The sacristan was well embarked on telling me how she was now a Londoner written all the way through to the rock, but her father had been part of a huge wave of Irish who came over in the 60s to find work in England. He'd worked for Camden Council for decades, and when he passed away, she said, she and her five sisters gave him the full send-off, four black horses with black ostrich plumes, drawing a glass carriage through the streets with his coffin inside completely covered in flowers, one of the wreaths in the shape of a tankard of Guinness, and the other at Arts Board. <laughs> I do the flowers for the altar too, so I know a bit about that side of things. We have tours coming here to see the church. It's a fine example of modern architecture. The 20th Century Society was here just the other day, and they were full of admiration. And they were very surprised we had such a flock here, but we do. We flourish. People come here from everywhere. We are a big family. And Cecilia on Yepukupo, I put in. I had to bring her back to the subject. And Ambrose, Ilofu, her partner, my editor's keen to get human interest stories about people like them. Dimpner stopped flaking the wax from the metal stand and her mouth quivered. We're praying for Cecilia and for the children and for her husband. We know Ambrose isn't her husband, not properly, because of their situation and their documents. Or rather, their lack of documents. The church isn't allowed to marry them, not when they're illegals. We've been able to baptize the little girls, Francesca and Madeline. That's a mercy. Father Damien would like to be able to marry them, Cecilia and Ambrose to each other, I mean. Ambrose is such a good man. He's such a, she's such a good woman, such a handsome couple. Father Damien's so afflicted. That's the honest truth of it about the whole situation. The law prevents him. But I know, he knows, and they know, I hope, that in the eyes of Our Lady and Our Lord, they are husband and wife. I feel sure they are. Our Lady is merciful towards sinners. She glanced across at the statue. It's a crying shame what's happening to them and to many others. A waste, a crying waste. She went back to tackling the deposits with a penknife, dipping them into a pail on the floor, so much residue of years. The wax permeated with whispered entreaties as the candles caught a light. Dear Mary, please make Bobby down and notice me and ask me out. <laughs> Dear Mother Mary, please make my period come. I am two weeks late and I never meant to do it. Blessed Mother Mary, please help my little boy to recover. Blessed Mother Mary, our Lady of Sorrows, help me pass my GSE in mats. I dropped a 50 pence coin in the padlock metal box on the wall and drawing out a candle from the sheave, touched it to the burning wick of one of the rack. On what one on the rack. I don't believe in such things really. But under my breath, I entreated the Blessed Virgin just the same, for something, anything, to set things right, somehow. When Dimpton manicured the candle stand to her satisfaction, she wandered off to the steps of the high altar and began clipping dead flower heads off the arrangements in the vases, me trailing behind her with my tape recorder. The little girls are very dear. Maddie will be making her first communion next year, all being well. DV, as Father says, 
if, if, if she lowered her voice and looked around the church. You never know when the UK border force, nay, in courtesy of our current Prime Minister when she was Home Secretary, where the UK border force, eager beavers, might be lurking. She crossed herself and looked over at the statue. Sometimes I think I will catch the Virgin moving, you know. If I move my head quickly enough, she'll be smiling at the baby and adjusting him in her arms and nodding in agreement that she's going to act. She's going to do something about the state of the world and all this. The sandalwood door opened and a pudgy middle-aged man, shirt sleeved, sleeves, waved at Dipna and came across the gleaming floor towards us, walking through the coloured pools of light falling from the stained glass as the April sunshine pierced it with bold, sweet brightness. Father, said Dimpner, this lady's from the local paper. She's after inquiring into Cecilia and Ambrose. Yes? He had peaked eyebrows and their points sharpened. We're campaigning, I explained, against indefinite detention and other legal abuses of our democratic traditions. Ah, that's good, Father Damien nodded at me. For a moment, I thought, you know how things are then. He paused and closed his eyes slowly and then reopened them, as if hoping the scene before them would have changed. I am seriously thinking of offering sanctuary here, he went on, in our church, as in churches in, time, in times gone by. I don't think our Lord will be happy with the language we are hearing, the threats people are facing. This is how the Romans behaved to the Christians at first. This is how Saul conducted himself before the road to Damascus and the great light blasted some sense into him and he became Paul. This is like, I shan't say, but what echoes do you catch in the sentence that the Prime Minister spoke a few years ago when she was Home Secretary? She said then, the aim to create here in Britain a really hostile environment for illegal immigration. What does that mean? It means sweeping up all kinds of people, branding them with the same stigma regardless of their contribution, their humanity. Think of the echoes. It's chilling, don't you think? And she, the daughter of a vicar, Anglican, mind you, but still, I don't, I don't think the Archbishop, this one or the last one, would find that sentiment very creditable to you. He was shaking his head, and his cheeks had spots of pink under the badly shaven white stubble. Must be saving on his razor, I noted, or have a badly lit shaving mirror, that it made me feel he must be sincere. <coughs> Dipna said, that's all very fine, Father, and I'm sure our blessed lady will grant your prayers. But for the moment, Cecilia and Ambrose need practical help. There's Maddie and Frankie to think of, too. Ambrose has been taken away, detention, they call it, three times. Each time indefinitely. Each time nobody knew if he'd be coming back to the family. So far, he has. Still, the threat remains. It's very hard on Cecilia. She takes it very hard. She's nothing like the young woman she was when she first started coming to church here. Through Dipna and Father Damien, I managed to arrange to go around to see the family. They're living in a single room about the third of the size of a tube carriage. Cecilia was sitting on the sofa looking warm as she was ill and had been in hospital. The nurses were so gentle with me, she said wonderingly. They asked me so kindly whether this hurt or could I feel this. She was astonished to be treated with sensitivity, with respect. I think, she said, I would like to go to school and train to be a nurse. Ambrose explained that this room was bigger than the first one the family had lived in. It was very full of furniture, with a three-piece suite which opened into their beds, and a fridge, a telly, and a wardrobe. The kitchen was off the hall, and like the bathroom shared with other tenants in the building. The hall space was crowded with plastic bags. The lights were kept down to save on electricity. Cecilia said she first saw Ambrose during Mass, but it was at the jumble sale afterwards that they began chatting. He was studying at Middlesex University to be an engineer, specialising in gas pipeline technology and computer programming. It was a Sunday in spring, mothering Sunday seven years ago, and Father Damien had preached about Moses' wife. Moses' family didn't like her because she was a foreigner. When she had a little boy and then another, the children were in danger too from the hostile feelings around them. They began chatting, she said, and Ambrose was so friendly. She was smiling when she spoke his name, and I could see in the soft light that came into her eyes that in spite of the exhaustion and anxiety, that slim, handsome young man in a clean arm shirt and crisp trousers who had a degree in engineering and was paying such attention to her. We began seeing each other, she sighed. 
and her voice slowed. Then the first baby, that's Maddie, well, she arrived. Amber is added, I was working for a company. I was a computer engineer, but I overstayed my visa. For six years now, I've been an illegal immigrant. He repeated what Dipna had told me. He'd been picked up three times. And every time they didn't tell me how long I'd be there, or if I would be allowed to stay here in the country, or if they, Cecilia and the children, would ever see me again. The little girls were wearing little boots and tights with patterns and dresses with flowers on the fabric, and they had their hair braided round their heads with one or two beads in the tufts. They were very keen to tell me how they'd been in the nativity play at Christmas. The little one had been cast as a lamb in the shepherd's flock, while the elder one, Maddie, had been given a proper part, the angel Gabriel. She has a big voice, said her mother, for a chit of a girl. During the sim hymns, she sang out loudly, then sings my soul, my saviour God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. She smiled and laughed, quietly remembering. Frankie, the younger one, went on. I had cotton wool and white crepe paper all over my head and body like snow. There was a bit of snow, not then, but later, and when we played in it, it was soft, but then it was wet. Mum made my costume, but it was difficult to keep on. She tied it to my arms with shoelaces out of my trainers that are too small. I really like the hymn, said Mandy. They clasped one another and danced about in the space between the sofa beds in their room. Cecilia was saying, we don't need much of anything. I do the children's hair and I would like to work at something like that. Hairdressing, yes, perhaps, if I can't train to be a nurse. But we aren't allowed to work, you know that. And I'm afraid, she went on, I'm so afraid. Although Ambrose hasn't been taken away again, not for several months now, I'm still afraid it will happen any time. Ambrose spoke to her soothingly. It is a process. We have to go through the process. We have to be patient. When Maddie turns seven, we can make an appeal again to stay. The reading from the Bible that day during the Mass when Ambrose and Cecilia met was from the second chapter of the book of Exodus. Dopina was the reader. It was the passage about how Moses is a stranger in a strange land because he was living in Egypt and later had to flee from there too to Midian, the stretch of territory between Egypt and the Holy Land, which is now called the Sinai, a kind of no man's land. There Moses married. His wife was called Sephora, and like Moses, she too was a foreigner in Egypt, and she became the mother of his boys. And Ger and Gershon means, Father Damien was saying later during the sermon that day, a sojourner, a passing stranger, a stranger in a strange land. You, my dear parishioners, he told them from the pulpit, so many of you here in our family, the Church of Our Lady of Sorrows, you too are strangers in a strange land. And Moses and Sephora and their babies foretoken what is to come when Mary and Joseph and the baby flee into Egypt from Herod and his murderous rampage. Like so many of you again who have had to flee your countries and your rulers' crimes. Moses understood what it is not to be at home. He was left in the bulrushes and he could have died. Then when he grew up, he had to take flight again because of an incident, a violent incident, and he was involved, though it is likely he was provoked. But anyhow, on this day, a day dedicated to all mothers everywhere, we must remember how his mother took a job as his nursemaid, all unbeknownst to Pharaoh's daughter, who had rescued Moses from the bulrushes and taken him to her palace to raise him as her own. And let's not forget, on this day dedicated to all mothers, the story of Sephora, who was the wife of Moses when he grew up. She too was from another country, a strange country. She was a Midianite, somewhere from the country, between the Holy Land and Egypt. She was black, or perhaps she was brown. Later, Ambrose began sitting beside her during Mass, Cecilia says. But she remembers that on the Sunday they first met, he turned to look at her where she was sitting behind him, while Father David was talking about Sephora. That Sunday, seven years ago, Cecilia was tuning in and out to Father Damien, so, as he preached to his flock, so many of them strangers and more frightened now than they were then to go out in the streets, where only last week an asylum seeker who, when asked who he was, said that he was an asylum seeker and was savagely beaten up. Ambrose tells me, when people learn we are illegal immigrants, they change their attitude towards us. Cecilia tells me, I am so afraid to go out. She does not go out, not any more on her own. Ambrose always does the shopping and he takes the little girls to school and fetches them. 
When the girls were at school, Cecilia would listen to the services on television. She didn't sing along because she couldn't, she said, but she liked remembering her little girls, especially Maddie, giving voice. Then sings my soul, my saviour God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. When they were home, their springing about added a spring to her spirits too. She would forget, briefly, to be afraid. She wanted to remember things to tell them about when she was young. But her mind was filled with fear. Fear that slid down her mind's eye like a blind against sunlight and shut everything off. My mother used to tell me stories, she told me, but I don't remember anything. All I can think of is what might happen, how he might be taken away and sent back, how I would never see him again. The little girls were dancing about trying to catch her attention, to tell her about their day at school, how it had been hand-washing day. They skipped about and laughed as they showed her. This is the way we wash our hands, wash our hands, wash our hands. This is the way we wash our hands, splish, splash, splash. Mummy is always very, very strict with us, they were saying, about washing our hands when we use the toilet, because there are many other people in the same house with us and they are not very friendly. Mummy and Daddy keep the toilet clean for us, but they are sometimes cross about it, and it makes Mummy sometimes sad, too. The little girl wrinkled her nose. Then they both skipped over and hid behind the sofa and began whispering, playing houses and hushing imaginary babies. Cecilia is trying to remember a song her mother sang, which she used to know when she was her children's age. But she can't. I'm afraid, she says, all the time. It's all I can think of. And when I try to remember, my mind's a blank. <laughs>